Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alain Pignolet. I'm a professor at INRS, Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And I'm glad that the organizer invited me to present the results of our research. And today, the title of my talk is The Quest for Dual Room Temperature in the Geophoric Philippines. Um, before I forget, of course, the work has been done by a number of people. My former students, Riyad Neshash, Luca Corbelli, Jan Tamar Hajlawi, my present student, Hossein Kalori, Dr. Katarina Nadja in my group, and also Professor David Menard and Dr. Christian Lacroix for most of what the magnetic studies are concerned at Ecole Polytechnique de Montréal. <coughs> the funding agencies are acknowledged here as well. Just a small reminder first, a ferric material. What is a ferric material? A ferric material is a material which has stable domain, two or more stable domain, which is characterized by an order parameter. <coughs> this order parameter is generally a tensorial ferric property, <coughs> physical property. Uh, the most well known is magnetization. It could be also polarization, dielectric polarization, or mechanical strain. <coughs> Those are primary ferric orders. <clears throat> this domain can be switched by the mean of the conjugated field, a magnetic field for magnetization, an electric field for the polarization, and a mechanical stress for the strain. Ferroics are heavily common. The presence of stable domain is, is opposite or different uh, directions on a hysteresis loop when you sweep the uh, conjugated field from negative to positive. So multiferric very logically is the combination of two or more of the primary ferric orders. In principle, the current convention is when we speak multiferric nowadays, it means that they are at the same time magnetic and ferroelectric. So they have a magnetic and electric um, param uh, order parameter. And this terminology is, all, is sometimes extended to other structures of such as multilayers or composites, which we then all the materials don't have all the properties, but the combination of them in a composite or a metamaterial, which is multiferic. One of the most interesting aspects of multiferics is the, couple, the coupling between the two other parameters. In the case of magnetic and ferroelectric materials, it's called the magnetoelectric coupling, which would allow to control the electric field with a magnet the magnetization with an electric field or the polarization is a magnet. <clears throat> there is a lot of promising multiferric uh, application, multi application of multiferric uh, materials. <clears throat> I don't have the time to go into details, but uh, one, for instance, one of the very good one would be to, uh, st to stop using a uh, current driven uh, writing head for magnetic devices and to replace that because it's consuming a lot of energy, it's, it's power consuming, and, and to replace it with a voltage driven uh, control of the <coughs> writing head. But nevertheless, I mean, for all these applications, these multiferric materials should be multiferric control temperature. Unfortunately, most of the on very a lot of multiferric materials are, are multiferric at low temperature. And low temperature means really low temperature. <coughs> Up to very, very recently, the only known multiferric material at room temperature was misfit ferrite, BFO. Uh, and then it has been predicted if we replace one of these non-equivalent iron by chromium, it has been predicted by a simulation, computing simulation by Spalding and et al. Uh, that it will become a much better um, multiferroic, which is called BFCO. And that's what we have actually done in my group for the first time in 2007. Then, with, more recently, you have other room temperature multiferroic, which have been uh, synthesized. And you have here a few examples, but I'm going to speak about this one and another one. Too. So there are different strategies to achieve good multiferric property at room temperature. Again, room temperature because you want application. <coughs> uh, for a single phase multiferroic, you can try to add or to improve the magnetic, the magnetism of a uh, 
referral electric material, which is basically what we have done with BFCO and BFO. Or you can try to add some uh, polar properties or ferroelectricity to a magnetic material, which is what I will show you with the epsilon ferrite phase. Another strategy, of course, is to use beta material composite heterostructures, structures, and it has been done with uh, two materials here, but we will have no time to speak about that today. That's for another talk. All the film synthesis here are actually um, synthesized by PLD, but there's a deposition with the conditions which are here. But, uh, that's not the main topic of the talk today. <coughs> that all the films have been synthesized by the position. So BFC, well, as I said, the only material which was known very uh, until shortly <coughs> was bismuth ferrite, which is actually not a perovskite, even if it's called BIFEO3, but it's a double perovskite because these two oxygen octahedra and iron in the middle are not equivalent. You see that the one is all turning on one side and the other one is turning on the other side. If the two, and if it wouldn't be the case, these two uh, magnetization would actually be parallel because if there is an antiferromagnetic coupling between the two, and you would have a zero coupling. But it, because of the uh, <coughs> moria jelinski uh, coupling, you have a slightly canted uh, anti-parallel configuration, which means you have a very small uh, magnetic moment in this equation. So as I said, Spalding and co-worker have, have tried in their computer to replace one of these two iron by chromium. So you have here iron, chromium, iron, chromium, iron, chromium, along the one on one direction. And if you do that, this material, which was a good ferroelectric, also a little leaky, uh, and a very bad ferromagnetic, and then you have ferromagnetic material, or magnetic materials with 0.02 or my uh, magneton per formula unit, which is due to this canting, will be transformed in something which is a good ferroelectric and a much, much better magnetic is two a new B per formula unit. Um, the problem is it has, for in order to that to happen, you have to have the ordering of the iron and chromium, and people believed it was not uh, going to happen, except of course in the computer where you can choose what you do. Uh, nevertheless, we tried to do it, and we did find some condition in which such an ordering is actually happening. So here you have uh, the room temperature ferroelectric loops. You see it's little leaky. At low temperature, it's much better. But nevertheless, it's obviously ferroelectric, as you can see here from the current loop. And it's magnetic. <coughs> and uh, the magnetic properties are actually quite good. Uh, the two mu B. <coughs> which were predicted theoretically or have been almost reached. <laughs> also, the ordering has been here, even if people didn't believe it would happen. You can see this with the super lattice, um, super lattice peaks in the XRD diffraction spectra or in the electron diffraction spectra, where you have also the super lattice, the doubling of the unit cell spots. So we, we do have a chromium uh, iron chromium ordering along the one way direction. Here is a phase diagram that we have actually uh, established and uh, in the blue region there are conditions where you have this ordering happening and of course depending on where you are the ordering is different. Uh, the ordering is also different uh, if you increase the thickness of the film and it's actually becoming worse as the film is increasing and the ferroelectric properties are behaving normally. <coughs> um, what we believe the ordering is happening, why, why is it happening? It's because we believe it's, uh, it's the presence of chromium between is actually screening, is actually shielding the very, very strong repulsion between the iron-iron interaction. So if you put the chromium in between, this is becoming more energetically favorable. Therefore, you have uh, driving force for the ordering, which is the lowering of this uh, repulsive interaction between the iron and the iron. Now the other <coughs> material, the epsilon ferrite, which is the epsilon phase of iron oxide. And this material is, of course, very interesting because it's, if it would be a room temperature 
metifluoric, and we believe it is, uh, it's only iron and oxygen, two very abundant, non-toxic, non-damaging for the iron material. Oxygen ferrite is a metastable phase, so it's in principle it doesn't exist in the bulk if it's not stabilized uh, between magmite, which is the gamma phase of Fe2O3, and hematite, which is the stable unknown uh, phase, alpha phase of Fe2O3. And actually, it is stable in a very, very small size domain here, uh, of the order of 10 to 50 nanometer. And um, that's why most of the epsilon ferrite phase uh, has been actually synthesized as nanoparticles. <coughs> Nevertheless, uh, and this material is very interesting, uh, and it has been studied between because it has very, very nice uh, magnetic property. It is the highest oxide, so the, the oxide with the highest magnetic anisotropy on a huge corrosive field, 20 kilohertz. <coughs> uh, it's also, uh, it also has a ferromagnetic resonance frequency, the low terahertz regime, which is also very interesting. It has a very complex structure where you can see you also have this oxide oxygen octahedra, but you also have oxygen tetrahedra. It's anti parallel orient, it's anti ferromagnetic coupled, but because uh, one is actually smaller than the other one, you have a small, um, a small magnetic moment in this direction, in this direction towards in this drawing. <clears throat> and because of the group, uh, the space group of this material, it is a polar material, it is a polar space group, so it is a ferro, it is a pyroelectric and possibly potentially a ferroelectric, as we believe it is. <coughs> but it is for thin films. Well, we can do epitaxial thin films of epsilon ferrite. As I said, it was done as nanoparticles because it's stable in a very small size domain, but uh, Few groups in the world, we were the second one, we were able to stabilize the beta stable epsilon phase by epitaxial string. When you do that, though, uh, you have a, an epitaxial relationship which is pretty complex, um, which is like that on the 111 substrate, where we have used three different 111 substrate to play with the epitaxial strain. And uh, an even more complex uh, epitaxial relationship on YZ100, where the first group. Uh, in, the, in the world to be able to go on one on Y is it one zero zero and why is it good? It's very it's useful because actually Y is the one zero zero can be grown on silicon. So basically we can use we, we can grow this uh, epsilon ferrite phase on Y is the on silicon. But as you see we have a very complex uh, epitaxial relationship. This complex epitaxial relationship both in one 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 and in one zero zero surfaces uh, comes has been found and uh, established by taking into consideration the, the, the best uh, lattice sub uh, oxygen sub lattice continuity at the interface. Uh, the XRD diffraction proves that actually we have an epitaxial films, and uh, when you do free scan, you see that indeed you have the following epitaxial relationship with the substrate. <coughs> Said before, why is the, is the most interesting one if you are if you are interested in growing on silicon? This film are magnetics with a very good magnetic properties, depending on the substrate, a little bit different. Not 20 kilo instead as before, but five kilo instead, which is still a very large coercive field because it's probably not a single domain as nanoparticles are. And you have this pinched loop, which are explained very easily by the fact that you probably have a little bit of uh, magnetite of a soft material inside. <coughs> but the fact that you have a low symmetry of epsilon of the epsilon ferrite phase compared to this cubic symmetry of the substrate makes that we have actually twinning. You have three different orientation in the case of 111 surface of perovskite and you have six different, orient uh, six different orientation. We have 12 here drawn. Uh, for film drawn on 100 YC. And this is not necessarily what you want for application. I mean, we wanted something which is extremely anisotropic, so the highest anisotropy 
uh, magnetic anisotropy for oxides. And here you see that because of this twinning, it's becoming quite isotropic again. So what we have tried to do is to use biscuit substrate. And if you increase the biscuit, you can actually um, select one of the orientation parallel to the uh, steps. And you can really obtain something which is actually much, much more uh, similar to the nanoparticles with an anisotropic material. As for the ferroelectricity, it was very difficult to measure right now, <laughs> but um, because it's extremely leaky, but we are still working on it. We are trying to use, for instance, ionic liquids, but this has a lot of challenges by its own, and we will report that on the next talk. Um, so basically, that we have done BFCO on epsilon ferrite, a production thin films which have good multiferroid properties for BCO. For BFCO and uh, with very good magnetic properties for epsilon ferrite, and we have some uh, polar properties that we are still working on. And this is for the part of the composite that we didn't discuss today. So just remain, <coughs> just remember that for a material to have interesting properties, it has to have these this properties at room temperature. And that's why we are looking for multiferric temperature at room temperature, because materials which are multiferric at a temperature below the liquid helium uh, temp uh, temp transition temperature or liquid nitrogen temperature are not room temperature even in the north or in Canada. <clears throat> 